um, have what an honor it is to have um, this event affiliated with Golden Hour California Photography from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. We are just so excited to be part of the program called uh, Local Access, which is a program um, that LACMA is making available um, a series of American art exhibitions from their collections. And um, it's a multi-year, multi-institutional partnership. So this is the very first of several exhibitions that we'll be bringing to the Riverside Art Museum. And this is made possible by Art Bridges. Um, so again, so excited and turning it over to Todd Wingate, our Director of Exhibitions and Collections to introduce our, our noted speakers today. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us at uh, five o'clock on a Monday afternoon. Um, appreciate everybody's indulgence as we have moved back and forth from doing this live to doing this Zoom to doing this live to doing the Zoom. And here we are finally at Zoom. And so uh, appreciate everybody's flexibility. So it's my pleasure to introduce today our, our, our two speakers. It's been um, really wonderful working with Eve on this project. And Doug is an old friend and we've worked on lots of projects and have another one coming up right behind this exhibition. So we're very excited to have both of you here with us today. So Eve is the Assistant Curator of Wallace Annenberg Photography Department at LACMA. She curates exhibitions that span photographic history and appear in galleries dedicated to American, Latin American, modern, contemporary, and Japanese art, as well as those devoted to photography. Recent projects include an exhibition celebrating Mexican photographer Mariana Yamplowski, This Is Not a Selfie, uh, Sarah Charlesworth, Double World, Larry Sultan, Here and Home, and Road Trip, Photography in the American West. Her exhibition on California photography, The Golden Hour, is on tour through uh, 2022 and is in Ram's, Ram's Members Gallery as we speak. Uh, Doug McCullough is an exhibiting artist and senior curator at UCR Arts. California Museum of Photography. His work has been shown nationally and internationally in more than 250 exhibitions. Exhibitions curated by McCullough have shown in a range of venues, including the Kennedy Center for the Arts in Washington, DC, the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, China, and the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, as well, of course, as the Museum of Photography. His most recent books are In the Sunshine of Neglect and The Great Picture, Making the World's Largest Photograph, and More Dreamers of the Golden Dream, a collaboration with writer Susan Strait, will be released on October 2nd. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Take it away, Eve and Doug. Great. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Drew. Um, welcome to everybody again. Yeah, five o'clock on a Monday. More power to you. <laughs> um, I, I first wanted to thank uh, Beyond Todd and Drew, everyone at RAM for um, just making the show look fabulous. Um, I'm loving every time I'm there. And um, yeah, I'm glad to have Doug join me, longtime photo friend and uh, self-declared provocateur for today. <laughs> a little bit. I'm just a sidekick in this case. You're really good. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. You can <laughs> kick me from the side, yeah. Um, so we're gonna talk about curating California, um, the broad umbrella. Uh, within that, obviously, um, golden hour. I was going to um, give you some background to my curatorial thinking, how I approach this topic that has been approached many times. Um, and, and then after that, I'm going to um, pick out some highlights. I've got four images. Um, Doug's got three. And we'll banter back and forth. Um, and you're welcome, of course, as usual, to throw questions um, into the queue as you think of them or wait till the end. Um, so with that, um, I guess, um, do we have my slide up? I don't know if Drew is- I'll get those, yeah. <laughs> There's only a few, I've already hinted at that, so Zoom fatigue. Um, yeah, that's a made up word, Californias, but I'm claiming it. <laughs> uh, you can go to the next slide. So obviously, um, for those of you who are, um, listening in early, um, California Soul was playing. Um, I, um, I'm i gonna go backwards just a little, well, I'll tell you about California Soul. Um, that was the start of my research. Um, 
my uh, musical knowledge is my weakest point. So I really thought, you know, I, I've experienced a lot of California exhibits. I've been involved in a bunch. I'm going to approach my research differently. And, um, you know, I stopped doing that after a while because I wasn't creating a soundtrack for the show. Um, but I landed on this song and it just sort of felt like a really wonderful moment. As you can see, it keeps reinventing itself in a very California way up to 2018. I think I stopped my research then. There's probably another remix out there, circa 2020. Um, but it also felt like um, a very subtle nod to the populist impact that California has out in the world in society in general. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, a little bit about Golden Hour. Um, the iteration at RAM is about 50 works that cover the period 1900 to 2019. And um, basically uh, what I was trying to do was not create your same old, same old exhibition that you've already seen on California. As I've hinted, there've been many, many just on photography, many multimedia shows. And I really wanted to break away from that um, just for myself. Was, I wanted to create the kind of show that I would wanna see. So I probably shouldn't admit that, but <laughs> that was right in there. Um, so my goal was to create something that was um, not so didactic, um, not chronological, and not uh, depicting every chapter of California history or photo history, because um, it's very easy to try to, to fall into that, that pitfall of covering every chapter, and that's just way too much. So to that end, you're not going to see, and here's where I point finger at Doug, you're not going to see images of California fire. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's no gold rush. There's no, um, uh, at least literal examples of all of these. Um, and, and it did make me think about those classic four chapters that are usually part of the storytelling, the, the gold rush, the black, black gold, as they called it, rush, the oil boom, green, which is the agricultural boom, silver, which is the film. And I thought of like clear being the technology boom. But I really had to forcefully kind of just break down all those silos and get away from that. Um, my other guiding principle was um, presenting historical work truly in conversation with contemporary and creating therefore like a whole new narrative. You don't have the old sort of siloed over here. Um, so you can go to my next slide. You know, I'll, I'll lob a question at you while we're waiting for the next slide. Um, <laughs> The the first thing I the first thing I saw now I'm interrupting this great uh, no I was to read me, the but... quote <laughs> <laughs> um, the, well, you're, you're you you framed it I think in your introductory statement as these are artists who are doing you're presenting impressions and interpretations of California and I love that because right. that then is sort of artist centric and escapes all of these tropes that you were. Exactly. Yeah. So. Because, you know, the, the bottom line is these artists are not creating work and expecting it to fall into one category. Like this is only about California light. There, there are usually so many other issues at play. And yeah, so I wanted to sort of honor <laughs> their, you know, impetus to create an image. Um, this is just a great quote. Um, I started, I went away from music and started doing some reading as you might expect. Um, and uh, Edward Abbey, if anyone in the crowd doesn't know him, is, is an amazing read in any way, environmentalist, essayist, and anarchist, self-described de self as. Um, a, just a little sidebar, um, Then There Is California was very close to being my exhibition title, and I am going to use it in the future, because <laughs> I got vetoed. <laughs> It's too obtuse, you know, like lots of that. Um, next slide, I can keep giving you some background. Um, the next two slides are just um, images of what I happen to have around my desk still and, and the reading that I was doing. Um, uh, the majority of the images, the books you're seeing are not uh, photo specific. They are in fact uh, fiction, nonfiction, sci-fi, mystery, poetry. Um, kind of anything else um, that was a voice um, 
in describing California, um, sort of outside of the normal bounds. So not- did you, did you take notes or did you <laughs> gather no, impressions absorbed. or how did this influence you? You know, I mean, this is it's marvelous. I love the research. Yeah, the I mean, I think, it just, you know, this tends to be the direction I go in. I cannot get enough about reading about different histories and viewpoints and communities in California, I think. I mean, California is like one of the few places in the country that I think you would continually want to investigate, almost like New York, New York and California, I guess. I'm not including Texas in there. I am just not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Alaska or something. I mean, every state has an incredible history, but um, we definitely um, have a lot to share. And I love diving deep into um, everything now is is a little LA centric, obviously not about California in general, but um, series of essays and really I can't recommend it enough. Um, there, there is a uh, fiction. It's about an indigenous community in Oakland. Um, the Tim Davis is my he's my current um, um, crush, <laughs> photo crush. He's an ex I put him in there because he's an example of so many photographers who are not based in or. Uh, regularly in California, but, but are drawn to it as a subject matter. Mm -hmm. So he teaches at Bard, is completely based on the East Coast, but is out here enough that he um, created this body of work that is all Los Angeles. Um, next slide, so I don't keep talking about books nonstop, but um, Sunseekers is about architecture that um, is created here and then finds its way out in the world. Three Californias is pretty insane sci-fi, three different iterations of what might happen in the future. And then Wonder Valley is not a new book, but um, that sort of traverses from the desert to the ocean. If anyone's read that, it's, um, it's kind of a book that I probably will read once a year from here on out. <laughs> um, next slide. This is my spot here. Um, so um, I did create um, categories to sort of wrangle this overly large topic, but through my reading and other sort of non-traditional research, realized that it, it's better to stay porous and to be both presenting the myths and breaking them down possibly. And so these uh, categories are how I organize the show, but as some of the artists have told me, I'm not sure which category I'm in. I could be in like three of those. <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's a way to sort of start breaking down those silos and talking about things differently. Um, let's see what else I have. To toss another question in, I, I've seen yeah. both versions of the show so far. Oh, like yeah. Bernadette and Moa and, and, of course, Riverside Art Museum. And I think that it's really smart that you didn't kind of box these into these categories and label it and have a color shift or something yeah. like that. The categories, so what use, I mean, how did the categories influence you because you sort of shed them in terms of presenting it or made yeah. them opaque or porous, as you say? Well, I, I felt like um, there needed to be a progression. We're gonna get down into the weeds about curatorial sort of building um, anticipation and um, audience understanding. So I felt like the creating California, you know, like that's the jumping in point. And then it was, it got progressively more abstract. And um, we haven't talked about the actual physical display is primarily through um, clusters or constellations or stanzas as I was calling them to sort of refer back to literature. Um, so my idea was that you would progressively be able to read these stanzas that much easier each time as we got more abstract. And um, then representing California, sort of coming uh, almost at the end is the most figurative, so the most literal. And that was sort of purposely supposed to be a reward system that you would <laughs> then get to that. I have to say, I'm really enjoying interrupting you. It's great. <laughs> 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 no, carry on. I'll shut up. Your question is, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I'm up to my um, my picks, which I can talk about these these categories a little bit further once we get in there. Uh, so Sam Contis, um, two images as one work. Um, she's definitely um, 
from my informal polling, like a, a exhibition favorite. Um, and you can see why. Um, but the truth is, um, this is actually a five part suite, as I admit, right there in the caption. She's um, one of a growing group of artists who don't work within the singular image. Um, she's got, we acquired all five and there's actually no order, but it is considered one piece. And once I get to that next slide, you'll see, but not yet. Um, I, um, I can describe a little bit about the background, which might not be immediately obvious. And if you haven't been to the exhibit, um, this is also somebody I write about in the catalog that you can get for free in the next two weeks while the show's at RAM. Um, Deep Springs is uh, both a school and a working ranch that Sam discovered. Um, she is also a transplant to California, totally born, raised, schooled, higher education, everything on the East Coast, came out uh, with her partner who got a position at Berkeley and she started going further afield into California. So she was on the edge, she would go in and discovered this amazing uh, still extant school that started at the turn of the century for young men only. It's now um, co-ed. And on her repeat visits, she really got embedded in their work day and saw how uh, what we consider sort of traditionally gendered activities got very blurry. So things like, um, because I had to participate in every aspect, they went to classes and worked the ranch. So they're doing laundry, they're prepping food, planting a garden, they're doing the, um, you know, the cattle run, doing butchering. And uh, all of a sudden, all those sort of gender roles sort of just sort of peeled away. And this sort of big, bold Western masculinity that's sort of staring you in the face um, it became lower cased, if you will. And um, let's go to the next slide now that you've had a chance to see the two that I included. So here's all five. But this isn't the way it would be on display, it's just what I could cram into one slide. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, it's an approximation of the size. So she definitely is playing with scale, color in black and white. The image on the bottom right is a re-photographed image um, from the school's archive. And um, so it's, it's definitely that um, current thinking of working with an archive is also embedded in here. And I think you can see now that you see everything, um, I found this work almost, um, like sensory overload when it's all of it. So you have the hot sun on that very sort of vulnerable back. You have the um, almost tactileness of the bloody, um, the blood from the butchering. And then um, the smell and the texture of the planting seeds in the top right. The center image is all about that wind, that hot wind blowing through the laundry line. And then the vernacular image is about, is about motion. That's actually a horse, a, someone on horseback trying to go up a real a radical incline. So they seem to be going up and going down at the same time. And so I love all of that, that she made photography sort of hit all the senses. Okay. I think these two, the two photos you included are probably, I emailed you, probably like my favorite in the show. They've, 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 I knew them from the book, Deep Springs, when I first saw that, whenever like it came out three or four or five years ago. Yeah, um, and I never even heard of this place. I'm like, I I have a geologist father, and I've tramped around the, the high desert. I mean, it's it was there. described as the high desert. I'm like, where I don't know this place, but it's in the middle of nowhere, like almost by the Nevada border, like yeah, east of Bishop or Lone Pine or somewhere. In the yeah, I was gonna say that edge, the farther edge of the state. Yeah, yeah. It's but the incredible. other thing, the other thing that's interesting about this to me is that the West has always been a place where everybody tries on new identities. Like you come, she herself came to the West and is now doing different things than somebody. Yeah. And, the, and photography itself has always been sort of a, a tool to kind of create new ideas about place and self, especially in the West. So it all connects in such a beautiful way. I don't know if you if all of that was crossing your mind while you were picking this or not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we got to, um, we got to know Sam um, when she just barely completed the series and was working on sequencing the book. So it was a really nice opportunity. This is the first time it's going on on view. Um, 
it's it, there's a lot of the work in the exhibition is just that it hasn't even been out there so it was it was kind of a thrill to be able to know that we had both acquired it early on and got a chance to show it congratulations beautiful yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna go to the next slide Let's see where we are uh clea mckenna um i'm including this to um Give the shout out to abstraction and photography, which is my true love. Um, also, as I was saying, trying to not have literal representations of some of those myths, but still having a sense of some of those myths. And so California, the great state with our incredible um, bounty of nature, the great redwood forests. If it's not clear to you, this is um, the tree stump that is, um, was born in 1824. So it's a rather large, ginormous uh, image. It's about 60 inches by 50 inches, 60 inches tall. So the size of the tree. Um, the way that Clea works through not just this series, but a lot of her work is very performative. And that was an element that I really wanted to include in the exhibition as well. So not, again, like Sam, not having the singular image represent your work. And also um, a lot of your general audience think the photograph is just out there waiting to be taken. Whereas um, again, when you read about this in the exhibition, you understand that she is performing. She's going out in the dark of night and um, taking a rubbing of light sensitive paper. Um, she's having to go in the dark so that it doesn't get exposed. So she's performing this incredible task. These are four very large sheets of paper that create the full circumference and then come back to her studio and processing them. Um, so I, I, I love that element, adding that performance in there. I also feel like it's, it's that perfect sweet spot of um, abstract enough, but then you, if you stay with it, try to be with an image, um, you do understand what you're looking at. And then further from that, it becomes kind of like meditative. You start to just sort of, she really uses that form to get you to almost an emotional state rather than just purely factual and going, oh yeah, that's, that's a really old tree. It becomes something I, more. I know, and first, you know, the photograph of course is an imprint and this is like an imprint of an imprint. And on top of it, it's a tree that's been cut down. I mean, it's like, Right. utterly connected to time and mortality. I mean, it's like a perfect photographic image. Right. All those layers. Death in photography. Yeah, I know. There it is right in front of you. <laughs> um, Clea, I think, is the only... I was I was looking at our slide selection. I think Clea is the only one in my group who is born in California and primarily schooled here. But I think you picked a few, two, few more people who were true natives. That's just the roll of dice. Yeah, you know, I, I had somebody in the Bay Area propose, you know, just one of these out of the blue, um, although I knew him before, uh, you know, a show a, a couple of years ago, you ought to do a show of photographers who were born in California. And right. he was somehow claiming that they would have a different point of view than if you weren't born in California. And I, I never really could figure out if that premise- I know held any validity or not you know I don't know yeah do like is there a difference what you know right well there is I mean you could you could take that um tack across all fields you know there's a lot of pushback for authors again to go back to literature who are writing about an area a community or right. a place that they have not been to they're not embedded and and yeah, so there's a it's it's an interesting quandary. Let's just say that. Like, but, which do which do you honor more? So just the image yeah. that's made or the fact that they are truly. Yeah, there's a question of honoring it, but there's a question of if you didn't know, could you tell the difference between a group that was <laughs> you know California born versus not? Well, that's easy. Well, no. no, you could. No, you no. could. Yeah. <laughs> I also often use like Louis Baltz in that argument. I mean, arguably he spent more of his career in Paris and he is arguably right. known for his California work maybe more than what he did after. Right. And but, you know, Hollywood yeah. movies, the most penetrating looks at Hollywood and a critique sort of what the invention of noir were all, not all, but primarily European emigres who landed in Southern California meant, what the hell kind of place is this? You know, it has a hard dark edge to it, but 
right. Well, there's a collusion between California and that European dark sensibility. So that's, they're that's, outsiders, though, is the point. Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. I never really thought of the argument sort of from that back way in. Yeah, yeah that the exile community is really what created at least a lot of Southern California. Let's just say. Right. Yeah, and that was also an interesting balance of having Northern California and Southern California represented mountains, mm. deserts, ocean. And, you know, to be honest, it's, it's subjective because it's my point of view, but it's also subjective because it's what entered the collection before me as well as on my time. And I, I purposely just didn't want to be filling in blanks. Like, oh, I, gosh, I need to find somebody who's done a <laughs> great <laughs> shot of the bay. I don't, you know, like, what? What, what can we include? And, you know, I, I feel like that's the problem with some of the other all-inclusive exhibitions. So that was oh, yeah. of a kernel that I was fighting. You know, don't, don't go scrambling out there and... I love it. You're, you're essentially operating like a contrarian. Everybody's doing that. The hell with that. I'm not going to do that. That's beautiful. I'm do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Next slide, because I think I have one or two. I have two more, so I better kind of move it along here. Um, these are uh, switching gears radically, going from abstract to figurative. But as I mentioned, I kind of sort of built in a reward system in the exhibition. It also allowed me to talk about diversity and people reinventing themselves. Um, these are uh, three contemporary tin types that are created by the um, African-American artist, Ed Drew. Only two of them are actually in the exhibition, but I love the suite. Um, the uh, center image and the image to the uh, left are in the show. Um, I don't think I need to really explain tin type process, but briefly, um, it's an early process, uh, pre-photo paper, obviously, and um, the image is is um, created right on the tin, so there's no negative. Um, this was used at the turn of the century, and um, for photo historians, I think it's connected quite closely to war photography because that was the most accessible way to create war, uh, imagery on the fly, um, and. For me, it had uh, that that sort of subtext had a lot of meaning, and it had a lot of meaning to the artist. Uh, he purposely went for the tin type um, when he was commissioned by the Klamath tribe members to um, do a portraiture series that was intended to be um, a healing process to uh, the tribe that essentially almost was eliminated. Um, and ended up being, having to merge and leave California. And um, uh, Drew has talked a lot about um, honoring a culture that did not totally disappear. And that was the goal of this portrait series was to sort of take back the images um, and to acknowledge that this is a vibrant community, uh, not gone, <laughs> sort of the, the opposite of the, um, Edward Sheriff Curtis, you know, the vanishing tribe as the um, Indians sort of go off into the sunset and he would use the word Indians. <laughs> so this was also a way for me to um, bring in indigenous peoples who are a part of our story, but there's really just not that much imagery until you get to obviously fast forward to contemporary. And um, yeah. So that was a sort of a key point. Um, I didn't have a lot to play with, but um, I was happy I had discovered his work up at the California Historical Society in San Francisco, which for any of the photo geeks, they, they do such incredible photo shows and have a lot of programming. So if you haven't discovered them yet, um, that's where I discovered Ed. Yeah, these are beautiful. I'll say yeah. no more, they're beautiful. Yeah. In, in <laughs> spirit and in just, they're beautiful. Yeah, they are. Next slide. This is my last. This is a uh, work by An Mei Li. And I haven't been telling you where, again, um, each of the other images wants to live in my thematic <laughs> breakdown. Uh, but I don't think I've put An Mei Li, I can put An Mei Li anywhere but in the final sort of last remembering California, which is really, um, yeah. It, it, the, 
that's a fuzzy word in itself, remembering, because um, it involves memory and it involves us changing memories. <laughs> so this image is of 29 Palms, the military base, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, acting as a training location for the first Gulf War. Um, An May Lee tried to get her um, press credentials so she could go overseas and be embedded and it didn't come through. So I think she actually won the better side of the ticket and she proceeded to sort of document these images of, uh, they're almost banal images of war, the prep. Um, and I would argue she's framed them so they almost look like they're a television set, right? It's, it's staged. And that's, that's sort of sleight of hand. It's very sly, it's very subtle. It just sort of hints at our immediate acceptance of whatever war activity our government decides to engage in. And also hinting at um, California's very vested you know, within the military complex that is a juggernaut here. Um, so I love how um, she's really messing with our idea of memory, like which, which is the war, the war you saw being trained for, the war you saw on TV, the war itself from an embedded photographer, you know, all those issues um, come to play in this one. And she always gives a lot of distance, you know, the, the, not always, but they tend to be, she's shooting yeah. large format, I think. And, yeah, she is. And, and they tend to be back, you know, backed up on the other hand they're very detailed so they're sort of quiet and subtle and yet you fall into them in some way because there's a whole lot of detail but yeah. I've always thought of them as being the opposite of like Robert Kappa where you know if the picture if the pictures aren't good enough you're not close enough like <laughs> the, she is always kind of backed up and they therefore they're more insidious and powerful and strange yeah. and questioning and kind of bringing up like where are we and what are we doing you know? yeah Maybe that's start, my response, but oh, it's, no, I agree. And you start to think about where is she, and it's like, yeah, and what, yeah, what are the dangerous elements here, really? The insidiousness uh, of of this endeavor. And she and, herself was was born in Saigon, I think, and was yes. came in 1975, and the whole refugee yeah. insanity at the end of the war. So, so this whole idea of uh, the helicopter medevac. <laughs> has, yeah, interesting ramifications when you think about her continuing to see that deployed out there in the world. I think we're onto your images now. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you're going <laughs> to interrupt group. me at least as much I will. <laughs> as I've interrupted you. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I had a tough time picking, you know, pick three images out of this show. I, I think I, I sent you an email saying, any, any, you know, any one of them. I love, I love everything in the show, really, honestly. Um, so th this is Suri Kaur. This is uh, a, a guy named Christopher Dennis, who was the Superman on Hollywood Boulevard, like at Groundman's Chinese for several decades, like 25 years or something like that. And this is in his apartment. And I have I've shot a lot of photos in Hollywood and so I've been in his apartment oh I didn't know he, that. yeah and oh. he was a, kind of a wonderful guy really uh, you know there are a lot of sort of uh edgy and um you know troublesome characters who will pose with people for money in front of <laughs> Chinese and he was not one of them everybody loved this guy mm -hmm. he died in 2019 so um his that's his couch so i have some photos of him sitting on this same couch this is a little bit of a sentimental pick <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i love the siri cower ones there's another well-known one of him standing i think in the hollywood highland parking structure and so yeah. he's in a, like a parking structure and it's really nice she shoots you know impersonators a whole range of these doppelgangers who spend their time costumed yeah. like celeb their celebrity lookalikes and make a living in various ways doing that and obviously that connects to California in a very strange way in the in the sense that you know Hollywood and LA is in the business of creating visual imagery that are fictions um, which then become 
a reality in this case. Right, it becomes his is, reality. <laughs> his the reality. fiction is his reality. Yeah. Right, and then she kind of like imprints off of that fiction to create another layer. And eventually you are in a hall of mirrors, which is I think where we live. So yeah. it's this ultra mediated state. Um, all yeah, of, and in this one photo is that sort of echo chamber if you look at it from a certain yeah. angle. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's kind of strangely quiet too, right? It, it's like, she's, she's definitely sort of doing this yin yang with the sort of man of action is <laughs> calmly yeah. on his dial up phone. <laughs> so, so many great retro elements in this, even for 2014. Um, the, when, the first time I was in his apartment, he's like, it was on Orange Street, like right around the corner from Hollywood Highland. And that's- Walk to work. Same. Yeah, walk to work. It's literally like a block and a half away or something like that. And so I hung out with him the first time with, uh, it was sitting on the couch with his friend, the Incredible Hulk, and his <laughs> girlfriend of the time, Bonnie, who believe it or not, was a PhD student in psychology at UCLA. Wow. And I wanted to ask her like, is he you like your project or what? You know? <laughs> or is he <laughs> your <I> boyfriend? <laughs> and I have to say there was like a bowl, several bowls of substance involved on his coffee table that's right out of the frame to the right. He's like, you want to <laughs> hit? I'm like, no, I'm fine. Um, and eventually he relaxed back on the couch and I heard sirens outside, but Superman, somebody needed help, but Superman wasn't going anywhere real fast at that point. Um, <laughs> I'll do, yeah, I'll just add it's 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 a very Hollywood picture, but it's also it's not your classic uh, shot of a premiere. You know, I'm thinking of all the other images to represent Hollywood that I've seen in exhibitions. And granted, she only created this series in 2014, but still. Yeah, no, and that's wonderful. There isn't. I don't think there's a single really Hollywood Hollywood image in your whole show. Is that correct? I mean, well. This no, there's two um, images that are essentially... Um, well, there's the Robert Cummings, which is... That's Hollywood, but the yeah. anime Wong. Oh, that's a, true. Yeah. It's basically a, a promo pic. Promo shot, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I, I did run across a, a comment by the photographer of this non-Hollywood, Hollywood photo, Siri Cower, who said that in shooting this project of these impersonators, she found herself sort of impersonating celebrity photographers like Richard <laughs> Avedon or Bruce Weber. And she just in the same way they've that. fallen into these identities, she fell into that identity, trying to produce your own, you know, versions of a Warhol Marilyn or a you yes. know paparazzo photo or something. I don't know. Yes. Well, that, yes. That's pretty great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the next one is not so entertaining, I would yeah. say. This is a great thing. Um, Willie Middlebrook um, in his own image, which is from a series. I can't remember the name of it. Portraits of My People. Portraits, of, like Portraits of My People, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a gigantic thing. You, you should, everybody should definitely go to RAM to see this. The, each of these 16 prints is 20 by 24. So it's a, a big, huge thing on the wall. And it essentially faces you as you come into the space. Um, this was done in response. I remember seeing this at Barnstall. Yeah. In, and in right, you know, after the Rodney King verdict, which is this is response to Rodney King. Um, so they're self-portraits. Um, and there's a beautiful statement. And I think it's really the only long piece of text um, except your own writing that's in it that, that contextualizes it. And I don't have that in front of me, but essentially he talks about, you know, in a fairly long and beautiful piece, responding to the racism, the threats to his identity, um, the formation of his identity within a racist society. How do you respond to something like Rodney King or all of the things that we've seen in the last since Rodney King and in the last few years particularly. And so this is then his personal, utterly personal response to all of that. I, I think it's so strong. It's a highly, highly 
political piece without being didactic at, at all. Um, yeah, know. yeah, it's and it's definitely. I'm glad you emphasize getting to see it in person because it that the monumentality of it is so the humanity of it is so visceral when you have to approach it. It's larger than you are. Um, you're having to read someone's face repeatedly and, and confront that expression of angst over and over and over. So just his choices for making this. He's also uh, was just starting to um, sort of work with that uh, solution, the bleach, it is bleach, which is uh, sort of eating away the image. Um, and I can't, I can't imagine, you know, this is him just starting to, to use that technique. And I can't imagine this work without that row. Oh, I know it is. I mean, all of it is perfection. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure on that, that second line down, whether he was bleaching it away or whether he was like spraying dilute developer on it not letting it fully develop or what i mean it's probably bleach but it's yeah bleach, bleach but you know it probably could be a mix of those and we just understood it as bleach right yeah, which, which connects to invisible man and ralph ellison and all that like i am here right struggling to be here within this system and yet i somehow am vanishing despite yeah. everything i don't know yeah it's intense um and it's another incredible like um we acquired it the year after it was made. So it was pretty, pretty amazing. And it doesn't get up enough. <laughs> so, do, so when you're, you're, you're working on the, the thinking and the curation and you've listened to your music and you've read these things, then how soon do you glom onto this piece? Or is this something like this in your mind as you're going along and going, it's oh, just yeah. gotta be in there. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of key pieces that are just sort of in there no matter what. And as I mentioned, a lot of work was recently acquired. So it sort of truly fresh in my head and felt like it had a home here. I mean, I should say, you know, like I didn't include Larry Sultan. I didn't include a lot of people who I feel like now, <laughs> this stage in my life, I'm not sure that they A, need another California show or B, they perhaps are talking more universally. I mean, I felt like this is such a specific response to something that happened in California but is also universal. So it's like every piece sort of had to definitely have that hmm. impact that is, you know, has California all over it. Um, so so yeah, at, at risk of forcing you to describe or forcing people to imagine photos they haven't seen, what were oh. a couple other things that had to be in the show that, that were oh. like keynote pieces? Or... I know I set myself up for that. I know you totally did. <laughs> um... <laughs> I'll, I'll list everything I just talked about because I keep circling back to those same ones. I mean, yeah. a couple of the images I've talked about today are in the, the free handout, which I should flash in front of you, but you have to, you have to get to uh, get to Ram to get this. All right. Yeah, get there, get it. Um, okay, I'll so let you off the hook on that. Let me off the hook. <laughs> I will, since I'm a, a collector of photo quotations and love quote, quotes is, there's, there is a nice Willie Middlebrook uh, comment that applies directly to this in which he said, I believe in appropriating images, so I appropriate my own, <laughs> which is nice. Oh, that's great. Like oh, that's, that's really good. I know. I okay, that. I guess we'll move on to the next one. Unless... Yeah, I guess so. Cool. This is uh, someone who teaches at UCR, Mirazaki. Uh, so he's a good colleague pick. of mine in some fashion. <laughs> And how big is this? This is a big thing. This, this is, is big. This is about nine feet by five, six feet. Yeah, yeah. it's huge. It's, it's like mural size, I want to say, for people who haven't experienced it. So. so there aren't a lot of, I'm trying to remember other beach photos, but this is a California beach photo from a set that he did of these coastline cliffs. And I saw a show, I think at Acme, I don't know, I'm not sure when the hell that was, when these showed with, they, he had a whole bunch of these and they're all like pretty monumental scale. So they're looking at scenes like this with this fog um, and a lot of coastal erosion or revetments or desperate attempts to keep the cliffs from eroding away then with, with different strange paths down. And they were paired with 
photos of trees that mostly had been, in my memory anyway, like horribly trimmed, oh, you know? right, right. <laughs> kind of butchered off. And they're really just not necessarily monumental trees, but smaller trees that have just been really badly. They're in a parking lot somewhere. You can, you don't know they're against <laughs> guy, but somebody's done just a terrible job of like pruning them. And so they, yeah. they, they're tor sort of tortured trees, which was a pretty nice thing. What, you know, I mean, what I love about these, he, Amir's done a lot of interesting work and some of it on the beach, um, is, is the fact that this is sort of a dystopian view of California beaches. There are these buttresses in this case, like there's gunite at the bottom, but in other ones, there's pilings, you know, just trying to keep the erosion from eating away the houses at the top. Um, so all these revetments. And then at the top, you know, it's faded into nothing. So the golden hour, the dream of California is sort of like, you can't see it. There might yeah. be a really nice house at the top. But, but you got all this stuff before it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I love that. Um, I also think of like his work. Um, he does do a lot of work that has some manipulation. So yeah. like uh, his other work, uh, the... Um, uh, lifeguard stations right he sort of <laughs> he takes away any way to access the station and you just don't see that for a beat or two which I love and I sort of think of this one like that too you're it's so dystopian you're sure that he has messed around with this like all these stairways that are I feel like they're going to nowhere for one but they're also keeping people out you know the the drawbridge up and he, I, I for a photo person, I love when you really start to question the veracity of the image you're looking at, right? Like, what's yeah. real? Right. Yeah. These, these are definitely more subtle than some. You, the lifeguard stations, the other ones that spring to mind are these pretty well-known ones in which he shot from below of cantilevered houses yeah. in the Hollywood Hills that are tend to be one story and sort of modernist sticking out over and then took away all the support so they're, right. they're like these weird almost you know hanging off the cliff frank lloyd wright went absolutely crazy with cantilevers in some insane way that and yeah. you know they're immaculately produced on a on a sort of modification photoshop level yeah so, you don't you don't understand yeah. that yeah he's messing with you for again a right. beat or two which i love right and, and since every image is utterly suspect in this day and age, it's really nice to look at big ones where you go, wait a second, wait what are you screwed with here? Or is this like a straight <laughs> shot or does it matter? Yeah. Right, exactly. And it's like, I mean, I sort of, this is going a little bit deeper than maybe every visitor will think, but it's like, do I believe everything I've seen about California? What's, what, what, what have I been fed that's completely messing with my idea of it? So, right. And, and, what, and what he's doing here, obviously, is traditionally all of those sorts of photographic sleights of hand, whether it's just the right exact angle at the golden hour to mm -hmm. be a chamber of commerce version. Well, he's flipped it. He's gone to the other side here where this is the anti chamber of commerce view of the beach in California, <laughs> except one that anybody who spent time on California beach is utterly, this seems absolutely familiar to me. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I loved um, naming it golden hour and then knowing I pretty much didn't have a single golden hour moment in there. Except <laughs> Um, yeah, that's nice to the, not uh, deliver. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> the Jennifer Bolande piece for people who will go see the show in the two weeks that it's at Ram um, does have a, it's a Coachella Valley, and it's it's definitely golden hour in that shot. So yeah, but even that is like a, there are billboards that right. viewed from an exact angle. I think they were part of Desert X, right? Yeah, I saw those things. Yeah, so viewed from a certain angle, the the shot of the mountains in behind Palm Springs or whatever exactly line up, and of course the yeah. the views of the installed billboards are shot to line up. So yeah. even that's yeah. playing tricks with you. you yeah, know. definitely playing tricks with you. The mediated uh, landscape. I I have said that you you pay attention to the landscape in the image more because of the billboard. You're sort of presented with the a preview, a mediated experience first, and then you start paying attention, which is right, right. ridiculous.
So what we're what I think even I are lining up on is you should never trust any photograph. But beyond that is it, when you make your own photographs, you should try and lie as much as you can in order to play in the same arena. Right. I think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's I think that's the takeaway here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we um we should break away to questions if there are any. I guess people. we should. Yeah. We can just keep bunting it back and forth easily. <laughs> oh, hey, Clara. <laughs> All right, we have we we have heckling. I know we can, we can have a heckle or two. That's okay. We can still go back and forth. But yeah, it's. I, uh, I wanted I, to I comment. Sort of, on it. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. I I wanted to comment on the um, the Cleo McKenna piece, the the tree. That initially, yeah. when you look at that. It looks like a ream of paper. It looks like it could be the, the edge of a ream of paper, which corresponds so much to what a tree, tree does. Came from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like a double, uh, double. Yeah. Subject. She uses really beautiful paper when you, again, see it in person, which you will. Um, it's very thin. Um, I think she actually gets this paper, it's sort of out, not paper that anyone uses stateside, I think she gets it in Russia, from Russia, so you can, um, very thin and allows her to be able to make those rubbings as she's doing, but it, it is also very, it's just like light as a feather and it sits in that frame, yeah, just like a wonderful ethereal representation of paper. Yeah, yeah, yes. The, 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 when I first saw those, those, pieces, I thought of the Susan Sontag quote about photographs are stenciled off the reel, you know, which is, and these literally are stenciled off the reel and then become a photograph. So it's like perfect. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, have... question. Yes. Sure. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how it, this exhibit works. Was each, does each museum receive like, I don't know, 200 photos, and then you choose from there which ones you're going to put in, in your museum's exhibit? Uh, good question. We probably didn't explain it carefully enough. Um, all of the uh, exhibits that are gonna be part of local access, Golden Hour is the first one, um, mm -hmm. are curated and selected from LACMA's collection. Right. So it's a package exhibition goes out into the world and goes to um, four local venues. It's different by default at each venue because I'm being responsive to the architecture, to the space, to possibly a different audience. So uh, working with each museum that it goes to, we talk through what kind of, what iteration is gonna be at your museum versus the one the prior. So there's two more, um, um, iterations, if you will, of Golden Hour um, coming to you locally, but definitely go see the one at Ram. <laughs> well, I'm going on Thursday. Okay. Um, yeah. so, so, I, 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 so once somebody uses a photograph, does that mean somebody at another museum does not get to use it? Or could I see the same photograph in all four exhibits? And that was the idea that um, all of it would travel to all the venues. Uh, there was a little bit of an overload um, purposely on my part with um, video work. Okay. Uh, so each venue, it, there's four pieces that are video works. And again, I'm working with each venue to figure out like what's the best because that involves a, a monitor, that involves equipment right. and not everybody, I knew everybody wouldn't be able to have all four. So they would, they would be unique in their presentation at each one for that reason. But the idea is that, um, yeah, that the entire show travels and uh, everybody gets to have a good LACMA bump with their audience and <laughs> show off a few jewels. And um, and then, yeah, then the next round is gonna come. I think there's actually gonna be a little overlap. The golden hour will still be trickling along and then you'll see the next wave. And the focus is all on American art. So you're gonna see, you're not gonna see repeat photo shows. The next one is um, graphic art. Mm. Okay. I won't, I won't spoil anything. It'll be different <laughs> each time, yeah. <laughs> well, very cool, thank you so much. Yeah, good question. Clara? 
Hi, yeah. Hi, Eve. Hi, Doug. Oh, yeah. um, I know that I, uh, Eve, I think I talked to you about this a little bit before, but um, I'm really interested uh, in, I guess, the parameters or, or the confines that you're curating this show within. Like, um, I know you mentioned, right, you're restricted to what's in the collection. Um, and you're also um, restricted in the technology of photography, right? which hasn't been around forever. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit about how that influences the show and the way that you conceptualize the show a little bit. Sure, yeah. I mean, photography only starts at 1839. Um, and obviously there's already a certain amount of history in California. And so we're not able to cover that. We're just not there. Um, but again, a lot of contemporary artists refer back to history. So that's an pretty easy get around really. It's just uh, uh, finding those artists. <laughs> um, and I guess I would say that I, um, I was trying to do justice to a photo only California show. Um, again, repeating myself a little bit, uh, trying not to have photography just be um, straight up documentary, factual. Um, when photography is included in mixed media California shows, that's what we tend to be. We're the very didactic image of a Hollywood premiere, boom, done. Um, image of, you know, Chicanas hanging out on the street, boom, done. That's how we're going to, that's how we're going to talk about that. And LA River, it's a straightforward documentation of the river that sort of defines Southern California so much. But um, I had a chance to do a show that's Again, only photo um, and, and tell a different story with photography. I'm not sure if that answers the question fully, but good question. I, I, a, yeah. a quick follow-up question, which I was curious about is, did you find the limitation of, of curating just out of the LACMA collection, which of course is large, but was that kind of a freedom in the sense that you didn't have to worry, oh my God, I got to ship all this stuff from all over the place and whatever, or was yeah. that a hindrance? Like what was the balance there between? Well, I think um, I speak for my colleagues. There's two, you know, other uh, curators in our department and we all add to the collection and we all, as we're adding to the collection are thinking back about how, like, is this image playing well with others? So we're not just like grabbing a random Siri Cower, uh, you know, image. It, it's really, we're already thinking about it in terms of how will it interact and, and be able to be used if it's not just in a Siri Cower so, solo show. So I guess to me, I, my quick answer is no, I, I loved having that restriction. <laughs> it allowed me to really share what I see when I, scroll through the collection on a database. It's like, I'm already like, oh, right. We got, when we got that, we were thinking of this. <laughs> Weston's always reminded me of that. You know, um, you know the, that's the best part of, if you're doing such a large group show, I mean, this is pretty large, you know, one image per artist pretty consistently, some exceptions. Yeah, yeah. Don't, go, don't go count, because then it'll look like I have favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, so I think that that wraps up our time. I know Eve, you've got a, another thing to get to. So yep. I think you'll, <laughs> you'll be on time there. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, Golden Hour is on view through the 26th of this month. So if you haven't seen it or haven't seen it enough, please come back and see it again or see it for the first time. Uh, we are opening Doug's show, uh, More Dreamers of the Golden Dream. Uh, with new additional photographs and new text by Delphine Sims as, as part of a sort of a, a reimagining of, of, of this exhibition. And so that opens on the 7th of October and runs through the end of the year. So we hope everybody comes out and sees that and, you know, come visit us at RAM often. Yeah, I'll be back again. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Doug. It was great. Thanks, Eve. You're the best. All right. <laughs>